collectively we like the 15 members or we think they're too tall, too short, too whatever, the fact remains that the 15 are the representatives of the people that we need to respect. And it is a group of a majority, eight or more, that then decides who the government will be. There is a basic tenet of our democratic system, and that is the ministerial responsibility and or accountability to the Parliament of St. Martin. And when that is not being done or being done sufficiently, given account, responding to, given information to the representatives of the people, if that is not done, then Parliament, according to the Constitution, can and should and should declare that the government does not enjoy the, the confidence of, of Parliament. It is not the first time it has happened on St. Martin. And in this particular case, what we have seen is that the, the, the Parliament, so a majority of the Parliament, put forward a motion, put forward a motion that was supported by eight members of Parliament. This was communicated, as I mentioned, to the, to the governor, to His Excellency the governor. From the Democratic Party's point of view, what was the situation that you, at a given time, and as I sometimes put it, I was either in the office or at home or wherever I was, minding my own business, so to speak. And at some point in time, you realized that something was taking place. You saw where um, you had three members on one hand who um, left the current, uh, the, the current coalition or the, the UP, et cetera, coalition. And then you had a situation where, so you have three, you have seven, and then you have five, the five opposition members. Um, what did the Democratic Party do? First of all, you outline the things that are important for us as a party. I've stated it before, the Democratic Party has set its focus on, on some, some very pertinent issues. We consider these our priorities. Um, we, we, we talk about and we will continue to talk about, um, about transparency and openness in government. It is critical that government dialogues with um, the, 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 the society, the community, but also gets feedback, also listens to the social partners. That dialogue is critical. So that's, 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 that's one of the points. Health and the St. Martin Medical Center is something that we believe is, is a priority as well. Reform of the fiscal system is another such an issue. Climate change and the things that come with it. And I have stated this before. Still too many persons, when speaking or hearing about climate change, figures, well, that is a scientific discussion that is taking place. But right now on St. Martin, we are seeing the effects. We are seeing the effects. We look at our beaches, the erosion, all of these things. So that too is important for us. The elderly and the aging of our community. We also believe, and that I'll do in a, in a separate statement, that we need to make very clear our position as far as the constitutional future of St. Martin is concerned. And specifically, what is, has been a buzzword during the last couple of weeks, the matter of independence. The matter of independence. And as I said before, uh, uh, then during the course of this weekend, early next week, uh, a specific statement would be forwarded. But it's important. Mm -hmm. There's also something that we see happening, we hear some of it in Parliament, that the Democratic Party is totally against. And that is singling out communities within our community to place the blame for everything that is happening on. Because when in Parliament we make these type of statements, and tomorrow you get so you have someone from the outside, someone of the public saying, "Well, you, uh, 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 you, the Chinese, you, the Indian, you, the this, you, the that, you are responsible for our ills." No, that is not the way you approach the problems that we have. We preach because where we are today, um, 
as St. Martin or as a St. Martin society has grown over the years and the decades and we have to deal with St. Martin today. Do I believe that for some of groups of St. Martiners, such as young entrepreneurs, that some type of affirmative action can be given and can be done? Of course, but that is separate than looking to blame others in our communities for whatever ills are out there. We are either going to be serious about social inclusion or we're going to stop using the word. We are either going to harness our skills and strengths that we have as a multicultural society or we're going to say that's not what we're going after. So social inclusion, social cohesion, bringing the people together on St. Martin, all of us to try and build this country, that for us is, it's, it is another important issue. When we go back to one the consideration talking about um, the untenable situation at the Smart Housing Foundation, um, Development Foundation, this one really um, caught my attention simply because, um, and I've said this before, uh, when the time was right for the formal government under the leadership of Mrs. Westcott Williams and with Minister um, um, Maurice Lake at Vromi, when they had to take the decision in the Council of Ministers to reappoint members um, that government has on the board of the Housing Foundation, they declined that and postponed it and said, leave the new government take that decision. And it, it, it shocks me, it, 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 well, it doesn't really shock me because I know the personalities, but what happened, both of them knew, or they did not read the Articles of Incorporation that states that the appointment of those new members was tied to a time limit. And as a result, the time limit expired and government lost the control to appoint those three members on the board of the Smart Housing Foundation. With the result that the present board, the board that was there, consisting of three members, the articles of incorporation gave them the full rights to appoint the candidates to fill those positions. So as a result, Put it clear bluntly in normal terms, the government, this government and other future government lost the control of appointing members on the board, the supervisory board of the foundation, simply because of the laxness of Bobby, the ignorance of the former two ministers uh, not being uh, taken the decision and the time expired. We um, <coughs> the motion reads that the government's cabinet consists of the ministers Mahasar Gums, Mark Mahasing. Dennis Richardson, Mr. Bond Gums, Tyrick Connor, um, Raphael Boseman, or the Sands no longer enjoys the confidence of the parliament and goes over to the order of the day. We have taken this uh, motion, as I said, we studied it, and we, have, we sought legal advice on the procedure, and um, also in particular, we can make use of Article 59 of the Constitution that says that um, the uh, Parliament could be dissolved by a resolution and, and that um, new elections can be called. Uh, last night, last evening, the Council of Ministers, after I said, as I said before, uh, receiving extended invitation, uh, uh, sorry, uh, not extended invitation, but extended advice from different legal um, persons, we forwarded a, um, we took a decision on the last slide, uh, the resolution to uh, dissolve parliament um, and to call elections, and we have forwarded this to the governor with a request for him to sign it. Um, we are awaiting the response of the um, governor on this matter, and um, we would um, uh, await that. But we feel that at this moment, what this country has been going through, for the last five years. It's the only way we can do. We've gone down the road four times, three, four times already of forming governments. And what happened? They have not last more than a year. And the people of St. Martin and the country do not deserve this treatment from our political establishment.
NBC. Yeah. One, two, three. Basketball three, once again. NBC. Check it out. Yeah. LBC. Is it so clear? Is it so Vitamold takes care of you. And now, check under the marked caps for a chance to win prizes. More detail on press. The reality of the situation is that yes, we have compulsory education, but we cannot afford to neglect the immigration aspect of it. I believe, Mr. Chairman, that too often we neglect that. Yes, we have those, and, and, and I'll state it here, Mr. Chairman, I'm not talking about those who are legalized. Absolutely not. Whether you come from Timbuktu or whatever, once you legalize, your status is clear here in St. Martin. This, these statements is not for you. The question is, does the illegal students that are going in, into the schools should they be that burden be on us, Mr. Chairman? And, and, and that's, that, that's the fundamental part of it. And how much more are we importing? Because yes, the ones that are here is our problem that we need to take care of. And that's why I ask, what are we doing to legalize those, Mr. Chairman? Because it's a problem every um, year you hear, there's a problem, there's a problem with um, budget, there's no monies. But where's the monies going to? A lot of it going to education to resolve these same issues. And let's, let's deal with that specific area, Mr. Chairman. I have a question. <coughs> we have a hole in the bucket system. I heard the minister indicate that there are talks with the Ministry of Justice. But Mr. Chairman, I need to know what is being done to close that hole. The capacity level is very low. We cannot hold any more. We cannot take care of it anymore. I heard Christopher Emmanuel made an, an ex, uh, um, um, a comparison when he had the, the the presentation about the dump where the children have to come to school and they're touching your children, they're touching my children, and I just I just thought about that because let's put that situation here. Other children, illegal children, have to make our children, legal and local, uncomfortable because sometimes you have overcrowding. Let us deal with those, Mr. Chairman. I would like to know what the plans are. The minister don't have to answer me right now. She can answer me in, in written form because at the end of the day, those same children, we don't know how, much, how many of them are here because they're not registered, Mr. Chairman. I can talk about that being at the Civil Registry Department. It's a problem. So then when the Minister of Education is making policies based on what statistics is she making those policies on? Minister, with all due respect, you have all the laws there. It's just a matter of enforcing the laws. The reason why I say so is because if you look at NEPA, I did a whole research of NEPA. NEPA started in 2014, correct me, with 288 students. Today, 2015, they are down to to 65 students, correct me. This is a, it's a drastic drop. Minister, also, you have where the board have not lived up to none of their responsibilities. They have not met any deadlines. They walk out of meetings on you. And you're saying, all you're saying to the public is, hey, be cautious. Don't say much about the board because it's negativity. But in the same national ordinance, it's saying, be open to the people. Present the facts. And as I said, stated before, and it's very important that we, we know that this here, here's another another situation where you have six lawsuits against NEPA presently. They already lost two. They just lost one there with the with the managing director. 
which you have to pay out. Now, here you go on another situation. The subsidy, financial subsidy for NEPA was given, correct me, <coughs> for education, to enhance the educational program. It's not to be paying out lawsuits and them. Who's going to be paying for that? And who told them that money is a mark for that? So here which my accountability is being, have to be presented to the board. We are making a lot of mistakes. The board is making a lot of mistakes over and over. And all we're doing as, as government, we just, you know what? First you come with a memorandum of understanding. You need a memorandum of understanding. You got to dismiss them based on the same presentation you did there with the national audience and everything. Stop being nice. Just stop being nice. Because at the end of the day, the first two meetings, I'll be straight. I'm very, very well informed. They walk out on you. I'll be straight. And that is unacceptable. And, you know, we got to get serious. The reason why I say so, because we're dealing with, with the student's education. I have, right now, you have a student who, a local entrepreneur, give that student the opportunity to work um, within one of the restaurants. He's so looking forward to his, his diploma. Looking forward. And up to now, we still can't validate the, the diplomas and programs. And he's ready to graduate. What are you going to tell the student? Um, let's say when he's ready to graduate. Hey, you know what? When you're ready, when you look at it, all his hopes and his dreams, just go down the drain. been said that behind every door, possibility awaits. How much possibility depends on which door you open first. Every day, we help our customers discover the possibilities in their lives. It all starts with a conversation. Scotiabank. Discover what's possible. In my opinion, everything is perfect and you would be great for the job. But I see here that there's a two-year gap in your resume. What did you do? I was hospitalized for mental illness. Oh, mental illness? I've undergone treatment, and I have a wonderful family that supports me. Well, that is good news. No, no, it's fine. I'm recovered. We'll contact you, OK? For a better understanding of mental health and what you can do to stop mental health stigma, please go to the Mental Health Foundation's website at www.mhf dash sxm.com Need a loan that's quick and easy Island Finance Up to 50,000 Get us really easy Island Finance For education uh, What we are trying to do is uh, educate the public um, as to how to go about using and checking and reading their meters, um, the new meters that we have in, been installing, and also to be able to um, check on their own consumption, that they don't go over their consumption. Because right now, the meters are very accurate, and seeing that they are accurate, they are measuring exactly what they use. So now that we are, uh, let me say that we are billing them more, but that they are just being built for the consumption of what they are using. Um, the HDPE lines that we installed about uh, 15 years ago are not uh, the, the characteristics of the pipe don't match to, to the intensity of what we do these, uh, nowadays. And when I mean intensity, meaning the pressure, the chlorine, the, the, the characteristics of the water has changed in over the past years. 
So what the water does, it attacks the water line from the inside. What I mentioned that uh, it crystallizes the inside of the pipe and that pipe starts to crack. And that happens based on the heat because we are very much in a, in a hot area. Um, and also the combination of chlorine and pressure. So though that combination of those three deteriorates the water line and damages the water line. And in the meantime, what we have done, we have bought a new water line, as to say, to fit our culture. It is chlorine resistant, it is pressure resistant, and it can go against the heat. Well, to save, <coughs> it is more, uh, what you have to do is look on your meter. There's a little um, uh, um, uh, uh, number on the meter where you, where you will see liters per hour. If you are not in your home using water and that digit is not zero, it can mean that you have a leak. So you would have to search for those leaks and most probably it could be in your toilet, it could be in your faucet, it could be in your bib, it could be in your shower. So you have to go and trace to find out where exactly this leak is. It can also be that it's a leak inside of your home where your water line pass or somewhere in, in your yard. If it's in your yard, you're lucky because then you can find the greenest spot in your yard and then try and dig it up and repair your line. But that little um, symbol on the meter shows you and, and indicates if you have a leak, yes or no. What I was trying to inform the public was um, how to save some energy by using the appliance wisely. For example, install a, a timer on your water heater. Those that have a tank, put a timer where it goes on 5 in the morning, it goes off at 8 in the, in the morning. You go to work, go to school, it goes off. It goes on in the evening, and it goes off after, after a certain time. The key also here is um, air conditions. Many people have air condition and they set the temperature to 16 degrees. Now 16 degrees is very cold. What they do then, they get a comforter to cover up to feel warm. Now that is where I say you're wasting energy. It is energy is there to use, but the waste comes in when it's too cold and we get back warm. What you can set the temperature in the room to let's say 22, 23 degrees, where it's cool in the room and not cold. That cold part, you're having the air conditioner run constantly to get the room cold. Versus it goes on and off during the whole day. The on and off periods is where you're saving energy with your air conditions. Another killer will be, for example, a microwave. To take a microwave to defrost frozen goods. That defrosting takes about 50 minutes or more to defrost your frozen goods. While you can take it from the freezer beforehand in water and defrost it much cheaper versus using electricity. Another one would be, for example, a refrigerator. Many of us have kids. And the kids goes in the refrigerator with the doors wide open for a couple of minutes, standing, gazing in the fridge, while they know, for example, they want a yogurt or they want water. Why not just open the fridge, take the water, take the yogurt, and close it back? We have to train our kids to keep the fridge closed close, close as much as possible to avoid the fridge being open, where the cold air goes out, and the fridge will work extra hard now to get better coldness again. Another one we, for example, using an iron, the heater. Don't just plug it in and go leave it plug in. Because once you're taking electricity to make heat, that's where you consume most energy. And those appliances I mentioned before, their wattage is over 1,000 watt plus. And the wattage what determines how fast the meter spins once it's consuming energy. In addition, we have resilient and ready, how to thrive through challenge and change. And this will be by none other than Valerie Burton. And Valerie Burton, she is a best-selling author, speaker, and life coach dedicated to helping people get unstuck and be unstoppable in every area of life. And so she's gonna be focusing on how to thrive through challenge and change. And I'm sure, you know, my, viewers right now there are so many people who are being challenged and going through so many changes so we're going to look at building blocks creating building blocks of resilience to effectively manage challenges encountered in leadership and life and she will equip us with a survival toolkit that will allow you to navigate disappointments in a way that make you better not bitter
<laughs> and persons will learn to maximize opportunities, bounce back from setbacks, and develop the thinking style that research has proven will help you succeed under pressure. Then we have Mr. Lencioni, and he's going to be looking at the untapped advantage of organizational health. And in this, he's going to describe and implement the four steps to achieving long-term success and optimal organizational health. He says, too many leaders are limiting their focus to areas like marketing, strategy, and technology. So in his latest book called The Advantage, he addresses this model where he says that leaders and organizations need to shift their focus to creating a healthy organization with minimal politics and confusion. That's interesting, right? And high degrees of morale and productivity and low turnover among good people. So those are some of the topics that we'll be speaking of. And of course, persons who attend will get a certificate directly from John Maxwell's company. In addition, persons who attend who would like extra credits, whether they're going to school and want extra credits or they just want to apply it to in the future to a degree or just to say that they have credits from um, for this event, the University of North Georgia in the States have partnered with Live to Lead, and so persons can get three credits for attending Live to Lead. And uh, let me just mention, th they are category one professional development CEUs that persons can get, and we are in the process right now of speaking with USM to see if they would also accept the credits for their students because a number of students are interested in attending.